afternoon. Um, we heard a couple of times this morning about the Stockholm Syndrome. I suspect that these are two guys that recognized they had it and decided they wanted to do something about it. <laughs> 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 and it strikes me that's what DART is like. <laughs> so, In some ways, yes. Good afternoon. This is actually the best slot for a conference talk because it's not right after lunch, which is always top. Everyone has food coma. And right before dinner because everyone's done. So hopefully you found the sweet spot. Um, my name is Kevin Moore. I'm a product manager working in DART Seattle. And I'm Dana Grove. And uh, we work at Google. Yeah. So first of all, who are we? I spent about 20 years of my career working on kind of the lower level of, of the stack. I've spent, I've been building compilers, JVMs, all that kinds of stuff at, at a bunch of startups at Sun. And the last seven or so years, been working at Google, working on compilers and, and VMs. And I spent the last 10 years really focusing on usable developer APIs. So uh, I started at Microsoft, did a bunch of work in C Sharp on UI frameworks, um, then went open source for a few years and did a bunch of Ruby and JavaScript. And now I've kind of count found the beautiful intersection between these two worlds working on Dart at Google. So before we dig into Dart, we want to talk about... I want to talk about why we started this. And, and we started this project in around 2010. And at that point, I know I was personally looking around and just stunned at, at the state of web development. And I was also really concerned because it felt like the world was fragmenting. And we we'd had this kind of nice thing where it looked like the world was centering around the web and then and then there was all this stuff that started getting developed, like phones and tablets and things like that. And the world started looking incredibly heterogeneous. And I started being really concerned that people were having to develop all kinds of different you know, on all kinds of different environments. People were building up, spinning up all these different teams to do the same kinds of things on different kinds of phones, web devices. The desktop had actually kind of centered at that point around the web, and so that was kind of nice. Um, but we also had cloud, which has been growing like crazy since that time. And the Internet, Internet of Things was also starting to exist around then. So I was really concerned about how we would actually build a platform that we could use to scale across all these different kinds of devices in a reasonable way. You're going to make me push the space bar? You're right here. <laughs> ah, exactly. <laughs> You're in front of it. So. So one of the things that had me worried was that it didn't feel like we were on a path to unite a bunch of the differences <coughs> in different platforms. So some of them felt like they would kind of fit together, like people care about power usage, whether you're in the data center or whether you're running out of battery on your phone, which seems to be pretty constant for me. They care about running with small amounts of memory. But things like CPU might not be getting unified anytime soon. We may have ARM running on phones. We may have ARM running in some parts of the data center. We may have x86 on phones. That keeps trying to come around. There are tons of different sensors, especially as we start looking at Internet of Things kinds of devices. Interaction models are really different, right? You know, like using a desktop is actually a different experience from using a phone or using a tablet. And application models also are different. You, know, you may have applications that are running purely offline on phones. You may have applications running in data centers. And so it didn't feel like we'd ever be able to build a truly you know, a monolithic kind of environment that would actually span all of these things. I mean, it, like, it's always fun to imagine the case where you're building this beautiful abstraction that runs over all the world's devices and over all the world's kinds of platforms. But, I mean, it's cool to think about, probably isn't going to work. So instead with Dart, what we decided to do was really try to build a principled system that started small and scaled up. So that's Dart. Um, it's many things. You probably heard at least the language. It is a new language, but very familiar. It's a set of libraries and tools. And actually, we try to do our platform support at the library level. So you can use the whole language everywhere. And then depending on if you're on the server or on, on the web, you can use a different set of libraries. Um, a set of really powerful tools, we found that as you scale up applications, especially in large organizations, are dealing with a lot of code, you really want your tools to scale up with you. Um, there's a set of lessons we certainly learned from more desktop and server-focused environments that we really like to bring to the web. We do have a virtual machine that runs really fast and scales really well. We'll talk about that towards the end. But we also targeted from the beginning making sure we can compile to um, JavaScript that runs across the modern web. So the code you use, you can use these modern tools um, and still target all browsers. So this is kind of the mix of two things, right? We want to have a system that's small and efficient, easy to bootstrap, but again, something that's very productive and you can use everywhere. Yeah, I mean, there, there's real balance here because it's really easy to be small, right? Like you can be small and useless and that's, that's trivial. But finding the right balance between being small and efficient while still being productive, that is much more difficult. So let's talk about productivity a little bit. You know, this balance between having something that's familiar and simple, um, and I'll show some examples, and then a, one example of how we can get really powerful among many. So again, if you've used kind of the squiggly brace semicolon languages, you'd be very familiar in Dart. Um, apologize to the Ruby Python folks, although I think you'll find some benefits there as well. Um, 
So let's, let's look at a demo real quick. And this is always the fun thing of coding on the fly. So if you actually go into the Dart editor, you don't, we work fine on the command line. We plug in for Sublime and for WebStorm. I'm just starting with our editor. Um, you get from the SDK. You actually go in here and do File, New Project. Pick a console app. Type in some things. Because I don't trust the network. I have it preloaded. So here's this demo thing. Um, this is the code that's generated by default. But let's start with a completely empty file. Let's start with an empty file here. And let's do Hello World in Dart. That's it. So a few things here. You'll notice I don't have any types. Um, there's a single entry point that's main, which is very straightforward. Still on the web, I'm always confused. Like, how do you tell the thing where to start? Like, it's just main, and it works fine on the desktop. This code actually works fine on the web as well. Um, if you want to type things, for instance, if you want to go in and say void main, you can, but it's strictly optional. Let's make this look a little more usual, though. So if you have more than one thing in a main method, which you probably do, you can use semicolons or um, squiggles. And let's create a data model. So a person is usually a good thing to start with. Let's do a first name, maybe a middle name, and I don't know, age. Let's do that. And do a constructor. So right off the bat, we can do something really simple here, right? How often do we set up a constructor for a class, and we actually want to set the argument names to the fields in the class? We just do that directly. So I can do this dot first name this dot last name. Again, since it's a structured language, it's very easy to do things like autocomplete really easily. You could have put some types on there, though, so we'd actually get some I'll type get, Just relax. I'll get, we'll get there in a second. <laughs> um, so let's new this thing up quick. So I can go um, our person equals new person. And we'll do Dan. Um, we should set our middle name, too. That's not a constructor argument. So I could go person dot. but. Instead, why don't we just do dot dot and do middle name? Again, this is a simple way to do constraint can create a complex object. So, what's your middle name, Dan? Dwight. I would have guessed something else. Um, and your age? Twenty nine. Okay. <laughs> um, so let's do this. Let's let's do twenty nine, right? That's a, that's you know clearly what I meant. That should work perfectly, right? Um, and this is where you fall down um, with the untyped system, right? And so the actually the ability to come in here and say actually no, it should be an age. Um, we can find out very quickly, like, no, I should not set this to be a string. I should set this to be a number. Um, and I can do that for all of these, right? So the, the the fact that we can actually optionally type is great. So if you're just starting with, you know, a simple idea and you do var, 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 var all over, and then roll in types later, which makes it much easier because the tools can take over and help a lot. Yeah, no, th that's, that's basically the style that we expect for people to use. We expect for people to start experimenting with var, and then as their APIs get solidified, we expect them to start putting types in at the API boundaries. So I can run this quick, and you see that I can instance a person. So kind of what you'd expect if you're coming from C Sharp or Java, I can create a, uh, a two-string method. And I can do something like string interpolation, which makes it really nice. And again, we get these hints, like I am actually subclassing or extending a, or overriding a method um, from the base class. And so that becomes very clear. You can find out very quickly up here that if I just print null, I immediately get an error that I'm not using person, so I actually get an error here. And so it's actually amazing as we've kind of built up and extended our analysis, the bugs you find where you define methods or fields or usually the case would be someone would create some test object and they wouldn't actually test that object and test some other instance. And you find out very quickly that object is unused. And so one of the benefits of Dart is it's a declarative language. So you don't parse it and update it in real time. Actually, the code model is understood statically before you run. And that means you can actually reason about the code that's used and hinted. And Dan will get into some of those details a bit later. So if you wanted to get really fancy here, we could actually just um, take this person object out, pass it in print, and then make this an error operator. And that's a simple Dart program. So again, simple concepts, optional typing, use it when you want to use it. Things like easy constructors, easy cascades to set fields, um, string interpolation. We try to make it a very straightforward language with some nice simple features. Um, another nice feature is that actually we have a package management system built into the, into the product. So actually, if we go back here a second, you can see I have, um, let's actually get rid of this demo thing and go back to the, the sample code. So if you go into the editor again and create a new console sample app, you'll see this. 
So you'll see we are calling print again, and I'm calling this method calc. So let's see where calc comes from. And again, this is a string interpolation happening. Let me right click, open declar declaration, and we can, go where we can go to where this library is defined. So this is defined in the same application. So what you learn very quickly in Dart is every project is a package. And package is kind of the, the encapsulation of deployment. And so even if I'm not going to deploy this or share this code with anybody else, I still think of it as a package. So I can import demo and the demo file from the demo package. And basically this maps to your lib directory. So you put most of your code in your lib directory. Um, and what's great about this is when I think about importing code from other projects, I can just use our pub system in, to install something. So an example might, there might be, if you go into our test infrastructure, you can see I'm defining a test for this, and I grab in this group method and this test method. These are actually coming from the unit test package, which I pulled in from our pub site. So if you go actually to our, you know, pub.dartlang.org, you can see that we have a mountain of packages. Um, it's very easy to add a dependency in here. So I'm actually going and open this guy up. Let's say I want to add a shelf, which is a um, middleware model for servers. I just click save, and we'll see if HTTP is going to be our friend. It looks like it did. So you notice we pulled in shelf package and all of its dependencies. Um, we follow semantic versioning from the beginning, so it's very easy to reason about what your dependencies are and how they work. Um, yeah, so we thought getting the package management system in very early so that we could really only have one would be a key part of Dart. So you don't really have to think about where your packages are coming from. They're all built with the same system, and it, we've had really good success and really good uptake with this. So far. And it's great because you can define packages and depend on them from your file system or from GitHub, to put a Git URL, our user pub system. And again, because we have a structured language, we can do things like, well, let me go see what the group method really does. And so I can right click and go. And this is not a string find or anything. We actually understand deeply where go came from, the package it came from, and go use it. Or I can do something and like be in a test and realize, no, it shouldn't be calc, it should be calculate. So let me rename it in this file. And you notice it actually gets renamed in the library as well. And it gets renamed in the string interpolation. So again, these are not find replace. You know, this is a semantic understanding of the code. Yeah, and so one, one thing that's actually kind of nice is that the analysis tools, for instance, are available as a package. So if someone wants to go build their own system, it's all very simple. And so we've used the, used the package system within the Dart SDK quite a bit. Right, and actually the other nice thing is because we have a semantic model, doing things like um, documentation generation is very straightforward. So our documentation generator actually runs over every package we publish, and we can generate docs from the, the code samples. So it's very easy to go get docs and all of the packages. So we have the pub site, we can generate docs for you. Because we have a strong semantic no knowledge of your code, it's very easy to do things like renaming your quick fixes, looking at the class hierarchy of things, finding the original declaration of a class. It's really straightforward. And it's also really powerful. So first, kind of talking about how we segmented the functionality in the Dart system. Um, I talked about packages, so packages have libraries. There's kind of a default package. We come with SDK, which comes with a set of default libraries. And these are all prefixed with Dart colon. So you'll see in Dart core, we have ints and doubles, maps, lists, the things you expect. Um, we'll get into Dart async here in a second. Dart IO has things like files and directories and web sockets. And then Dart HTML has things like window and button and SVG web audio. And so this is how things are segmented. So you can actually write a mountain of kind of data objects if you wanted to and just stay in the core library. Print works the same and or it's implemented differently, but it works with the same functionality in the browser or in the server. So you can call print. And then if you want to target specifically building a web server versus building a client application, you target these other libraries. And what's great is you actually can run your tests for your shared code on the VM and the browser. Um, and then, you know, depend on things or share code between a client app and a server app. Um, I want to drill in a little bit on our Dart async functionality first. Um, and this is basically because of the model for applications. We heard about this a little bit today that you really want to be careful about blocking calls. If you care about you know, responsive UI for a client app, you, wanna, you don't want to block when someone clicks on a button. Likewise, on a server, you don't want to do blocking I.O. because that means you're destroying your throughput. So having a clean model for doing asynchronous operations really makes coding a lot better. And so in Dart, we've done a couple things. One is we start with a very consistent model for asynchronous operations from day one in our async library. And then recently, we've added some language features, which we'll get into. So first, I'm going to start, you know, once we start, people started writing um, asynchronous code that dealt with the web, this is usually what you end up doing is callbacks, right? So I might have some method that, you know, gets a response from a server, pass in a URL, and then you have a callback. 
you need to call back for the success case and the error case. And of course, this composes really poorly. So you have cases where, you know, I have to make sure I handle the error, not only on the get, but if I want to parse the returning value, I need to make sure I also, you know, have the error handler happen if my parse fails as well. And so multiple la layers of error handling. Now, obviously, this has been solved with things like promises, which are starting to get more popular. Um, in JavaScript, it's been around as a task in C Sharp for a while. And so what we've done is something very similar with a future. And the idea is a future, you can call a method and get a synchronous result back. And then you can chain these together. So I can call the then method on future and pass in a callback. And then that can chain together by calling then again. Or even catch errors. And similarly, that thing can um, pass in another future. So it's very easy to chain this logic. And this allows us to get rid of callbacks. And because we have this shared concept of future, it's very easy to compose. So this code becomes this code. Yeah, and that top code would be much worse if it was more complex because this stuff really scales nonlinearly. I mean, you can just get a pile Insanity. of spaghetti. Insanity. It's funny you bring that up, Dan. Yeah, <laughs> it is funny, isn't it? Um, so let's look at an example here. So this is just a throwaway example. You'll see I'm for looping over an object. I'm doing an if check. I'm grabbing some results by calling a method. You know, I count the failures and you know, increment a counter in my loop. And then if my failures is greater than zero, I call some method. So kind of follow that abstractly. Some simple linear code. Now let's imagine we wanted to make this asynchronous. So it turns out with having the library support at least for futures, it's relatively straightforward in Dart. We realize we have to pop the loop out and now call each instead of just doing the normal for loop. We need to do a then and cascade that in to count to capture the failures. We need to then tr track that down to call flush then exit. So it works, but it's... It's still kind of unfortunate, right? Like, we actually lost some of the language support that we had for all these nice constructs. Right. I mean, I wouldn't want to do this with um, the uh, callback passing model. I don't even want to think about how this would look with the callback passing model. But even this is pretty ugly. So what we've done in C Sharp, inspired from some other languages, is actually bake this concept into the language. And so since asynchrony is such a core concept, not only do we have it in our default libraries, but now in the new release of Dart that's going to be out very soon, Dart 1.9, we have support for it in the language as well. And so now we can just sprinkle in async. And so now this void method is now a method that returns a future. I can do a normal for loop and I'll do an await within the for loop, do a normal incrementation, and then I do something like await for the result there. So now we can write asynchronous code as though it's synchronous code. So of course, with you know great power comes great responsibility. Use asynchronous when it's appropriate. You know you pay the cost for doing callbacks and things. But for cases where it really matters and you want to do complex logic, it actually becomes very straightforward to do in Dart. Yeah, it's it's really nice. When we first started this, one of the things that I was worried about was that you couldn't write scripts in any kind of reasonable way using you know, using the using the language without async. And now you can write it almost the same way that you'd write it synchronously. Um, and actually, we've gone through the package management system I showed you. We actually rewrote it all to use this async stuff, and the code is so much better. The, the developers were delighted to have to be able to rewrite it because it does lots of network access, lots of file access. Yeah. But let's go beyond the future um, and talk about um, other features kind of related to this. So let's back up and do something really simple, right? Um, you know, let's write a method that returns three items. So if it's just three items, of course, you just allocate a list and return it very quickly. We do this all the time for a small set of things. The problem is if you want to deal with a number of items, doing an allocation for three is OK. But doing allocation for 3,000 or 30,000, if you're enumerating files or going through um, a stream of bytes in a file, gets really expensive really quickly. So let's take a, another kind of contrived example. We're calling some method you know, with a source argument. We have to allocate a list. Let's call in and we're going to call some method that returns another collection. And we're going to have to resize our collection here, add another single item. Let's do recursion and walk through a couple things. And again, we're going to do another resize here. We're going to go through this code several times because every level of recursion, we have to go in and reallocate an array. We're throwing it away, this list, every time we so go through the this, recursion. So this is like you're walking the whole directory hierarchy, right? And at each level, you're allocating lists and popping them back And then throwing and them away. Concatenating them and tossing them out. And it's possible you actually want the whole list in hand, right? But that could be a decision made by the user of this method. You don't need it in this case. So obviously, iteration is a solution here, or innumerable in the C-sharp world, right? And so we have support from this from Dart from day one, where it's very easy to do cascading operations. I can start with a list and do a where that returns an iterable <laughs> that's lazy. Um, I can expand that into a set of other items, and that's also lazily initialized or 
lazily instantiated and then do a where clause with that. So are people familiar with kind of this iterator lazy model? Familiar? Cool. So what we can do now in Dart is take this code and basically say, well, if you want to do an iterator here, you should, very efficient, but of course you'd have to go implement it. And if anyone's had to hand write an, an iterator before, it's the most miserable thing in the world, <laughs> especially if you're trying to get it right, because it basically involves writing a state machine and managing that. So again, like some other languages, um, I think inspired by C Sharp, um, we actually add the support into Dart. So to start with, you can just flag your method as sync star, which basically says this method um, returns, you know, basically you think of every normal method as being a sync method. A sync star method is a method that returns more than one item. So there's the star. And then I can just yield items. So every place where you would normally do an add or an add all, you just yield. And this creates the state machine for you. And so it becomes very straightforward to go over a set of items. And in fact, if we go a little bit beyond this, you notice I had to create my own little nested for loops. We actually have a feature called yield star, which this says is go off and yield all the items in this nested collection. And that's really nice because if you look at the, um, the example here with this normal yield, every time we do the recursion, we'd have to go in and call this yield for every recursive item that you go through. And so actually it doesn't scale linearly at all you end up with a, with a um, I think it's quadratic scaling um, when you have deep recursion here. And we can avoid all of that with a yield star keyword. So that's, you know, cool features like this exist in C Sharp. What's really exciting for Dart is not only do we have this model for, so we have iterators for lists, we have future to handle a, you know, a single item we're dealing with asynchronously. Um, we also have stream support. So stream is our class for eventing. So we don't have the notion of an event concept in Dart, it's all streams. So if you're dealing with a button click on a web page, that's a stream of click events. If you're dealing with IO off a network, that's a stream of bytes. Everything's a stream. And what's great about that is we can apply these exact same concepts to streams. So let's say we want to make this asynchronous. Again, back to the directory listing example. I can actually now do a stream of item and use async star. So now I can yield against a method that returns a stream of events. Or I can actually await for over a stream of um, subsources and yield those. And you get the exact same semantics. So we go all the way from iterators in the synchronous case to a really clean model for single item asynchrony with future, and then also futures, and also streams for streams of things. So if you wanted to write the app that enumerated directories and then every file in those directories when it en enumerate all the bytes, you can do all of that without having to keep a list of the file contents on, diff, on in memory or the list of files in memory. It's really easy to write these kind of APIs and compose them because we have these simple concepts like future, stream, iterator, and support them in the language. So, no more blocking, more slamming. <laughs> <laughs> so it's familiar and simple and really powerful, and our async support is just one example of that. That's productivity in Dart. But of course, productivity doesn't matter if you don't have a place to deploy it. Exactly. So we wanted, yeah, from the start, we wanted to be able to deploy Dart everywhere. And the nice thing about this is that you can use all these super cool language features like Kevin described, and you can use them in all the places that we su where we support Dart. So we started work at Google. The browser matters. matters matters quite a bit to us. And so we, we started it in the browser. And today we have um, we have Dart on the web, and we do this by compiling to JavaScript. So yeah. Stockholm syndrome or not, we have to run on JavaScript. It's got to it's got to run on all modern browsers. We don't support IE7, unfortunately, but um, but we do support all the modern browsers. And we have a number of mission critical Google applications that bring in you know, real dollars to Google running in running in Dart on JavaScript today. We had a couple of goals with this project. The first one was that we didn't want people to pay a tax for writing code in Dart. So we wanted to give you all these nice language features and nice library features, but we still wanted to be able to produce small and very fast JavaScript. We also wanted the system to be powerful, and by that I mean that anything that you could do in a browser, we wanted to be able to support in Dart. So that meant that if people wanted to be able to build Chrome apps, for instance, or they wanted to be able to access you know, all the new cool OS level features available in browsers, we wanted to enable that for Dart users. And finally, we had a goal that we wanted it to be Dart. And by that, I mean that we wanted it to retain the same semantics that you have in Dart. We really thought the code sharing aspect of Dart was critical. And to do that, we had to maintain the same semantics, um, whether we're compiling to JavaScript or running in a virtual machine or, or anything else. So we started thinking about this, and the first thing that we realized was 
geez, we actually need a compiler for this, and we need we need an optimizing compiler because there is a ton of stuff that needs to be done to be able to get small, fast JavaScript out of this. And I don't know how many of you guys took a compilers course and read this book. Um, I certainly spent a lot of time on this, and you know it has a mountain of different optimization techniques, and I think we've probably implemented most in the in the Dart's JS compiler at this point. So all the traditional kinds of compilation kinds of optimizations have been done. But then we realized that you know we could actually go much further than this. And the reason that we can go further is that Dart is declarative. That means that we can understand the application without executing it. And that's you know, pretty fundamentally different from JavaScript. You know, we actually can start you know, looking at the imports from the entry points, and we can really understand what's happening in the application. And we can do optimizations based on that. There's all kinds of stuff that you can do outside the compiler for this. For instance, Kevin was showing code navigation. You can do all kinds of cool refactorings. And you can do these neat compile time optimizations that, are, that really wind up being critical for us getting good JavaScript out of the system. The most important of these optimizations is what we call tree shaking. And the concept here is that you know, what we see in JavaScript a lot of the time is that people are building these super tiny frameworks. And you see things saying, you know, you can get, you know, get this framework and add six kilobytes to your JavaScript or something like that. And we were hoping to get out of that world. And so we wanted people to be able to build reusable libraries, but we also wanted them to be able to tree shake things that were dead out of those libraries. So the idea here is that in, an, in a typical application, you're going to wind up with a lot of dead code in the application. And we want to get rid of that. And the nice thing about Dart is that we can start at the entry points, and basically we can just compile down to the points where, you know, to all the points that are reachable in the code. Stuff that's not reachable, we don't have to include in the application. And so we wind up being able to eliminate quite a bit of dead code with this. And it's really, it's really nice because it actually fits really well into the Dart system as a whole. The second thing that we needed to do was think about global type inference. And one of the things that's important here is that in order to get rid of a lot of this dead code, you actually need to start understanding something about the types that are present in your program because you need to understand which methods are actually called. Kevin showed you some interesting things about the type system and you know, ways that you can actually skip types. In fact, in Dart, the types are completely optional, so the system ignores the types entirely um, during compilation. And yet, we still want to be able to determine what the types of things are as much as possible. So what we do is we basically start at the entry points of the application, and we iterate and try to reach a fixed point where we understand what the types are. So in this, you can see that main is calling foo, and it's calling foo with an integer. So we know like, at, the, at the call site in main, we know it's not being called with a string. We know it's not being called with null or some other complex object. Down in bar, you can also see that print is called with a string. So that's, some, that's a bit of knowledge. Then we can see that, that bar is called with an int because from the entry point in main, calls foo, calls bar. We can also see down at the bottom that foo is being called with a string. And so at this point, we now know that bar is being called with only an int or a string. So we know it's not being called with some complex data structure, that, and there may very well be libraries and, and functions that we're able to optimize out of the application based on that. It turns out that getting global type inferencing right probably made the biggest difference in our compiled JavaScript of anything that we've done, because it really is the fundamental bit that enables tree shaking to work properly. However, we need more than just Dart right. to JS for web applications. So, so far we've talked a lot about, about how the code works really well, but you want to actually build a full application, and that requires frameworks. So we've done a bunch of work here. Um, we've done a bunch of work to support Polymer for over a year. We're continuing to invest in Polymer, actually, making sure that you can reuse components, hopefully across all of the JavaScript existing components within a Dart application. And then we're working very directly with the Angular team on Angular 2. Um, Angular 1 was a great set of experiments, but of course the, the Dart implementation of Angular 1 was a completely separate project. We've actually worked to unify that, so there's one Angular project for Angular 2 that generates both JavaScript and Dart to the exact same API in both places. And this is going to be the core to a number of internal applications at Google. Yeah, in some ways, uh, you know, Angular 1.dart was kind of like Angular 1.5. There was a lot of experimentation happening, and Angular 2 will be the same across JavaScript and Dart. So let's look at an example of a Polymer app in Dart. So again, because I didn't want to fight the network gods and we're using packages, I have a kind of a pre-rolled app. So if you go into the Dart editor and just do a new project, it's very easy to say create a new Polymer application right here. And this is a set of things that have already been discussed today, which is this notion of how do you componentize your thinking about applications and actually isolate things. So both Palmer and Angular have work here to make sure that you know when you create things like styles, you actually have a very good encapsulated model for a component. So if we open up the application, 
aside from just some smart defaults around making a good mobile app, you'll see that actually the body is very simple. In fact, this is an instantiation of a custom element, which is imported from your package. So you'll see Polymer app is the name of my package. We kind of discussed package imports before. So I'm actually bringing this HTML in from this package. So again, I go into the lib directory. That's where the packages exist. I can see I have two files. So the HTML is very straightforward. You know, I define, you know, basically I want this to be a block component. I'm reusing some of the paper input styles that, you've, that Google's talked about. In fact, I can run this really quickly to show you. So obviously the simple thing is it reverses things, so. And this is running on Dartium, right? Yeah, yeah so this is actually the, a custom build of Chrome that we ship with Dart Editor that has the Dart VM built in, so it's very quick to, to edit things. Um, but I can actually take this exact same URL and throw this into Chrome, and it works great, or Safari. So under the hood here, we're actually running our Dart.js compiler and turning this into JavaScript that works across all browsers. I was like, what are good palindromes? I was like, Hannah, I was like, atop pots, whatever. Um, so the way these are defined is very straightforward. So you have your app, your um, component defined here. You can import other components into it. I define you know, an input element, and I define an event handler here. Um, I do a binding and say, I just want to display some text and bind to a reverse property. And then I define the backing in Dart. This is complete deja vu for me, because I worked for on WPF and uh, Silverlight at Microsoft. That's this idea of separation of markout and code. It's actually cool to see exist in the browser. And so you can see here, we define a class like you'd expect. And this extends a Polymer element. There's a little bit of glue to say which Polymer element on the screen you tie to, because for some reason, web people don't like camel casing, so we have to put dashes. So there's a way. And dashes really don't work well if you're doing your apps like, well, I can't subtract an app from a main. It makes no sense. So we find a way to glue those two things together. But it ends up being very simple. I can create an event handler here, and I get the value for my target, which is a string, and I can split that string, and then I can reverse it and join it together. If I wanted to make it really excited, I could put an exclamation point in there. And you'll see that we actually assign to the reverse property, and this is some of the other work we try to do to really reduce spoilerplate. So instead of running all the complicated logic, you just flag the attribute as observable, and we'll do the work to make sure that the property change event logic just happens for you. So if I go back to my app now and I reload it, I can type something and it seems like I'm a very excited 12-year-old, I don't know who writes like that, and backwards. It's the new pig Latin, I swear it'll catch on. So the Polymer stuff's available now, you can play with it in the editor. We're working really hard on Angular 2. You can watch the progress of Angular 2 right now on GitHub. Um, it's actually really cool watching the Travis bots go, because every build you can watch both the JavaScript and the, and the Dart stuff get recompiled and work. Um, it's gonna be a really great release, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, so we have a bunch of people that have Dart to JS already in production today. So Google Fiber, who we'll talk about in a minute, a um, bunch of startups like Blossom, Soundtrap. Um, we have a number of properties at Google that have already deployed in Dart to JS, and we have a bunch of new ones that are coming online. Um, Shopping Express is there. I wish wish we could get that in Seattle. I um, know. For some you know reason it's not. kind of funny. None of these Google products are available in Seattle, which is... Um, <laughs> Google Fiber, we're still wishing. Yes, yeah, exactly. someday we'll get it. But but real people have this deployed in production today, and it's working well for them. This is Montage, this is Blossom, and again, our sweet spot here is you know we realize it's not a zero cost to bootstrap a new language. We find is as the size of your application grows, having a very structured system makes your productivity go up a lot. So at Google, we build big apps, we deal with lots of developers, and so starting with a language that's a little more structured and has good tooling around it makes us much more productive. Yeah, it's actually kind of interesting. When we talk to a bunch of our customers inside Google, you know, what we hear from them constantly is, please give us more checking, give us more ability to identify errors that the other guy is making in my code. Yes, so. that's always <laughs> the case. <laughs> um, so you know, our one of our favorite examples is, you know, there was a slide presented to us, and the title was Miraculous. And they, you know, had tried to rewrite an app a few times using Gwit and other tools. Um, they shipped it ahead of schedule on Dart. Um, the creator of Minecraft um, played with bunching, building a bunch of web apps. And obviously, obviously, this is a Java guy who's kind of avoided doing web and had a lot of fun with it. Um, this is actually one of the most painful bugs to deal with because I didn't want to close it because it's, you know, expressing its love. So <laughs> I, I, th I think I closed it by design. I think was the idea that they would really enjoy Dart as a system. 
Yeah, so, so we're going to keep working on this because the deployment of JavaScript is really important for Dart. So first of all, we've got a bunch of compiler people, so obviously we're going to continue improving optimizations. Faster startup time is a really key thing for us now because we want to enable really nice experiences on things like tablets when they're running, uh, when they're running in a browser. We're also going to be spending time on improved type inferencing. We talked about how important that was. There's still a ton of work to do here. This is not a solved problem. Second thing we're focusing on is enabling two-way JavaScript interop. We know that there's a ton of JavaScript out there. We also know that we're not going to replace JavaScript. And so we want to be able to make it easy to create components in Dart and deploy them in JavaScript. We also want to make it very easy to integrate JavaScript components and libraries into Dart applications. So one concrete thing that we're working on right now is making it trivial to incorporate Polymer elements written in Polymer JS into Dart applications. Not just so Polymer, but anybody using web components. Yeah. So if you use the stuff from Mozilla or other folks, it just works. Exactly. And then the other thing is happening is that some browsers are starting to ship ECMAScript 6, and we don't want to keep our heads in the sand on this. We're going to incorporate ECMAScript 6 output where it makes sense into, our, into the JavaScript that we're producing. Chrome is already starting to ship some of this ES6, and other browsers are coming online pretty fast with it. And obviously the cloud as well. So when you go beyond browser, the great thing about having a VM is we can you know, deploy it natively places. So we've done a bunch of work to support um, obviously Google Cloud, because it makes lots of sense internally, so you can deploy an app now using the new App Engine feature. But actually that's all wrapped up with Docker. So you can use Docker today. In fact, if you wanted to go and spin up Docker instance and run a Dart server in your machine, you can do it now. Don't do it now. Don't do it right now, because you <laughs> download a Docker image and there's an Ubuntu snapshot that's like 40 megs and everyone here will hate you. But later today you can go play with Docker. Um, it works really nice. and. Uh, We've actually done a bunch of work to make this really composable. So I worked on a project called Shelf, which basically is a middleware model. You used Rack or Connect in the JS world. Um, it's similar. And what's great is it's based on future. So it's very easy to make a composable web application where you have a, a pipeline of middleware and they call each other. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, that's OK. Although some people maybe have done Connect or, or Rack in the Ruby world will be familiar. And because we have this nice concept of future, it's all future-based. So it's really <coughs> easy to do these kind of pipelines and make it really composable using Dart language features. And of course, things like supporting the Google APIs, which are really nice. And again, this is a great example of code sharing. We have a little bit of plumbing you have to do on the server versus the client, because you have a different model for doing HTTP requests or OAuth handling. But the core library and code is shared between the two. So if you want to do you know, Google storage APIs, it's basically the same code whether you're in the client or the server, just you connect it up slightly differently when you bootstrap the application. So we have support for those. Yeah, so yeah, there is this mobile thing that's been happening, and it's obviously pretty darn important to, to all of us. And today, we, we, support the, we support the mobile web. So we basically enable you to run Dart applications in Chrome and Safari. So that gives you a pretty good strategy for, for running on both Android and iOS. Because we have a VM, we're also doing a bunch of experimentation with Android and iOS right now. And we, we don't have anything released yet, but we have out on our um, code.google.com repo put out um, an experimental VM that's play that runs Actually on nicely GitHub on now. Android. Is it on GitHub now? It's on GitHub. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so all of our stuff <laughs> is in the process of moving to GitHub. Um, and we're also doing some experimentation around iOS. iOS is a bit more challenging because it doesn't allow you to do JIT compilation in your virtual machine, but we have started some experimentation out there. That's also happening in our GitHub repo. There's stuff beyond just phones, though. Um, Google Fiber, which, as I mentioned, we can't get, um, is using Dart and using Dart pretty extensively. So one cool thing for, for using the same kind of development environment, being able to do code sharing, is that these Google Fiber boxes actually have both a Dart server running inside them and they have a Dart client-side app running on, running on Chromium. So they've, they were able to you know, use the same kind of end-to-end -end development environment and the DVR server is written using command line Dart, you know, using all this nice future stuff that Kevin talked about. And then the application itself is built using um, is built using the web. And these are a MIPS, pro MIPS processor, right? Yeah, exactly. We actually have a MIPS port of, of the Dart VM that's out there. So, it, you know, Dart VM runs on ARM, it runs on MIPS, it runs on x86 and x64. Speaking of that, you can also, because we build it to start small and scale up, Dart runs just fine on things like a Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone Black, and it's very cool. I mean, the footprint of this thing is so tiny that it really can it really can run on all these small devices. There's actually a class at MIT using BeagleBone to teach an Internet of Things class, and so it's a nice in-between between doing a C, more structured language, and doing JavaScript, and it scales down great and runs great on BeagleBone. So this is kind of the combination of things. We try to make a very productive system that you know folks at building apps at Google scale could be really happy with. So it's simple and familiar. 
but it's really powerful. And we try to build it on some base concepts like futures and streams so that you can learn a few concepts and use them everywhere and compose them really nicely. Yeah, and we designed it so that it would, it would run everywhere. So the system where you have these really nice language features, you can have really nice tooling support for it, can run on everything. So you can run it on the web, you can run it on mobile, you can run it on these tiny internet of things, and you can run it in the cloud. So you really can use the language that you're, develop that you're developing in across all modern devices. That's it. So questions? Um, I'm Kev Moo everywhere. So you can find me on GitHub, and I'm you can see um, things there. Dart Dashlang, I don't know who made our naming, is uh, us on GitHub. You can see a lot of our packages there. Yep. Um, there's a G plus thing, and we're happy to see if you guys have anything you want to know. <laughs>